This podcast is a collaboration between Costard and Touchstone Productions and the Dads from the Crypt podcast. Humans! You're not worth the flesh you're printed on! Fuck this cowboy shit! You fucking hold up, hold up, well then there, motherfuckers! All you have to do is give me the goddamn key! Then we could get on with our lives! Alright, this property is hereby condemned. Welcome to another episode of the How Not to Make a Movie podcast. I'm Alan Katz. Gil will be with us shortly. Before we get going, though, if you like what we're doing and there's a like button you can hit, please hit it. It really does make a difference. And even better, please subscribe. There's so much going on around here. It it seems kind of criminal to, to miss it. Among the things going on is a streaming TV series that Gil and I are taking out into the marketplace as we speak. It's called Are You Afraid? And it's got a lot of tales from the crypt in its spirit. It's not an anthology like crypt. Rather, it's one story. Very dark, scary as hell, and funny as fuck. Well, If you think cannibalism is funny, which we do. Flesh eating ghouls. For a long time, we humans have been deeply afraid of vampires and zombies. Send for paramedics. Fair enough. Vampires and zombies are scary. But neither vampires nor zombies are real. Flesh eating ghouls, on the other hand, are real. They've been living in our shadow for thousands of years, hunting us feasting on us, treating us like food. But some ghouls are tired of living in the shadow of their food. Those ghouls have decided it's time to leave the shadow and put us in our place where we belong. On the menu. It's an eat or be eaten world. Flavored by fear, filled with the monster we should have been afraid of all along. Flesh eating ghoul. Are you afraid? Better be. Coming soon. Now, the reason I'm bringing up Are You Afraid is because Gil and I are taking it to the marketplace with our very dear friend, Ernest Dickerson, attached as both an executive producer and as the pilot's director. Our friends Chelsea Rebecca and James Janice from Dead Meat are also attached as executive producers and actors. But that's another conversation. Today, we're revisiting a chat that Gil and I had with Ernest last season. And that conversation is especially relevant this season because in our next episode, Gil and I are going to have a conversation we've waited almost 30 years to have. Or rather, our guests have waited almost 30 years for it. Ethan Reif and Cy Voris, the two very talented guys who wrote Demon Knight, are finally getting their chance to scream at Gil and me for firing them off of Demon Knight. You don't want to miss it. But that's next episode. In this episode, we'll get Ernest's side of the story because Ernest has a side of the story too. We'll also tell Ernest's whole story. And it's a good one. Today, we're talking to uh, an old friend, Ernest Dickerson, who is a sensational director. Originally started out as a DP, uh, director of photography for a number of Spike Lee's uh, early films. She's got a habit. School Days, Do the Right Thing, Mo Better Blues, Jungle Fever, and Malcolm X. I actually didn't realize that they met in college at NYU. Uh, I, Spike and... and uh, Ernest. And Ernest, yeah. Yeah. And then it's also interesting from a perspective of how do you get into our business? How do you get into this world? They're all different avenues to get. And I think you'll find, hearing and listening to Ernest, that there's... Uh, there's more than one way to get in. Relationships are super, super important. And, and relate. And surely Ernest's career is a study in, in the care and nurturing of your relationships. And having the talent. Oh, well, yeah. That, that's You got to yeah. have that when you walk in the door or the relationship right. won't do shit for you. Right, right. With that in mind, here's Ernest. You're, you're an East Coast guy. Born and raised. I mean, I've been here on the West Coast for yeah. ooh, gosh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Years. But all, all three of us are East Coasters who transplanted to this place. Yeah, yeah. Born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. Started my career in New York. 
and um, uh, was living in, uh, you know, went to school in Washington, D.C., undergraduate in Washington, D.C. You went to Howard. Howard for undergrad, yep. Yep. And uh, there you were influenced by a guy named Haile Jirima. Yeah, he was a film instructor, although film was not my major. My major was architecture. Okay, why why architecture? Well, I was interested in environments and building, and I thought it was a way of me giving back to the community. It uh, seemed like the thing I should be doing at the time. What did your and folks it, do? I, 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 I know, aside from, 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 okay, you went to Howard, you, you came from Newark. I don't know anything about you, Ernest. What did your folks do? Well, my dad died when I was eight years old. Oh, I'm sorry. He, uh, he ran an A&P supermarket in Newark. Huh. He was like the first, first African-American uh, manager at the A&P. What, what, was was what was your dad's name? Ernest. So I'm, I'm like the second. Huh. Uh-huh. And then my mother was a librarian. She uh, worked at the Newark Public Library. And um, because of that, uh, she had me reading from an early age. Cool, cool. Uh, and uh, so, you know, in, 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 in elementary school, I was reading a lot of science fiction. Hmm. Uh, I, actually got in, I actually got in trouble in the fifth grade for reading 1984. <laughs> because uh, because uh, Sister Jean David said I was committing the sin of pride by reading a book that was above my grade level. So, so does um, Sister so Jean Davis mean you went to a Catholic school? Yeah, Catholic elementary school and Catholic high school. Huh. And they tried to get me to go to a Catholic uh, Catholic college. Uh, we actually looked at Holy Cross which would have been interesting because if I went there, I probably would have met Clarence Thomas because he went to Holy Cross in undergrad. So, you know, so, um, but um, I didn't do that. Um, you ended up at I, Howard and, uh, and you, you had a great experience at Howard. Yeah, it was a five-year program, five-year architectural program. And actually, I before I went to Howard, I did a couple of years uh, as a part-time student at Rutgers University, so uh, in Newark and worked. So that by the time I went to Howard, all my core courses were done and I could just concentrate purely on the design and architecture and the electives that I had wide open, I started taking uh, film classes in the film school and um, photography in the art school. And I wound up taking a, a, a minor in color photographic illustration. You know, it, it, it's not surprising as I think about your shots at the beginning of, of She's Gotta Have It, your shots with the Brooklyn Bridge mm. are really beautiful. It's beautiful. It's like it's like you have an appreciation for its architecture. Thank you. Yeah, the great thing that architecture gave me was uh, problem solving, you know, how to solve problems. That's really what architecture is all about. You're given, and pre-visualization, because uh, you have to pre-visualize what you want to build. You know, you, you're, you're given a series of uh, problems, a neighborhood or an environment that you have to solve some problems in, you know, uh, traffic patterns and all that other kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, Howard was a really hands-on, very practical uh, school dealing with architecture. Most folks that once they completed their undergraduate at Howard went on to MIT. A lot of folks went on and just did rather than doing a two-year program at MIT, they were able to do it in one year, because we, you know, we had a lot of a lot of engineering involved in, the, in what we took. So, but I had a chance to uh, study color photography, and um, actually got a lot of photographic work while I was there. I tried to get I tried to get work because I had been working as a part-time worker since high school, so I tried to get a part-time job in an architect's office, but the Nixon administration was in. And building was at an all-time low. So they were telling me stuff like, yeah, we can hire you, but we can't pay you anything, which kind of defeats its own purpose. So, uh, but uh, I wound up being able to get work at the school newspaper um, at a time when the editor was trying to really make it heavily dependent upon the photography department. So we had a you know, we had great cameras, we had Nikons, you know, and I learned how to uh, print. And all the work I wound up getting was photographic. 
after the five-year program, I graduated. And by that time, I had a part-time job at Howard Medical School doing medical photography. So I stayed there for... Now, that, so uh, at, what did you do as, as a medical photographer? Did, did you scrub into surgeries, for instance? Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes two to three times a week. You know, huh. we documented a lot of surgical procedures. A lot of the uh, surgeons were also teaching. So sometimes they wanted teaching slides to, to highlight how to perform a certain, um, a certain procedure. Uh, so we did that. We, d we developed film. We did public we, relations. We we have something in common here. Here, uh, you know, my my dad was a, a general surgeon, and occasionally photography was my hobby when I was a, a kid. And I would scrub in and, and do photography for him. So he had pictures to take to his rounds. Yeah, well, it, it's, we it's a fascinating a... experience. I, I I really enjoyed it. I, you, you too. Yeah, it was it was fascinating. Uh, I ate no red meat all the time while I was working there. <laughs> no red meat at all. Huh. Uh, it really put me off of red meat. But um, uh, and, and it was it was a great bachelor's life living in Washington D.C. Um, and doing that job. And and me and this other guy, we shared a house in the northeast area of Washington D.C. And we great, we gave great parties and but we but we were going to see a lot of movies. Uh, because, you know, the AFI was having a lot of retrospectives and you had a lot of the uh, repertory cinemas that were showing like great double bills. Like they would do a double bill of of uh, Man Who Fell to Earth and Don't Look Now or oh, Walk oh, oh, Nick Rogue Heaven. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, double bills of the, like The Long Goodbye and uh, McCabe and Mrs. Miller. So I had a chance to really see a lot of movies. Oh. We went to the movies like... Um, Oh gosh, usually around two to three times a week. Yeah, yeah that's, and, there's, there's uh, a whole education right there. Yeah, so I really started to realize that that was um, that was where my true love lied. And um, at I, this point, that, you, you had never stuck a, a motion picture camera to to your face. Well, I wound up taking classes in in cinematography at uh, in the in the in the film school, the School of Communications. And that's um, where Haile Jarema was teaching. Cool. And so I took uh, I took Cinematography 101, which basically taught how to be a good assistant camera person, you know. Um, and, then, and then I took a summer class in cinematography where we actually shot some stuff. I didn't really have a lot of experience behind movie cameras uh, until I got to NYU. But we also did some, some surgical cinematography, but not much. Most of it was stills. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I drew the assignment to shoot a series of leg amputations because um, cool. they, you cool. know, a lot of people with diabetics and had impaired circulation. So, you know, you had a lot of folks that were get, getting gangrene. So they wanted a series of stuff, how to, the different types of saws you know, um, yeah. how to cut and stuff like that. And those really got to me. I mean, the hemorrhoid surgery didn't bother me. The eye surgery didn't bother me. The open heart surgery didn't bother me. But the amputation got you. Yeah, well, my girlfriend was a medical student, hmm. a psychiatrist. And I, I was talking to her when I said, well, damn, you know, these amputations, they're not as bloody as some of the other stuff, but they're really, they're really fucking with my head. And huh. she says, oh, that's the reason why, because two deep-seated primal male fears are castration and losing the legs. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, <laughs> you know, and so that's... Can't that help being who you are. Yeah, well, that and a few other things really made me decide that um, I needed to get out of Washington, D.C., and that's when I applied to film school. Huh. And you end up at uh, NYU. Yeah, 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 I applied to... I think applied to visual arts at NYU, but I went up and and, and looked at the program at NYU because I, you know, uh, going up to New York and checking it out, and I really liked how it was very practically oriented. It was all about making movies. That um, you spent maybe like the first couple of months learning the rules, and then you're given a camera and a certain amount of film, and you have to write a film. And so, you know, it was. Uh, non-sync sound narratives in the first year we weren't allowed to do sync sound until the second year mm -hmm. um so 
it was all for me it was all visual storytelling one of them was uh actually doing a music film which was like a music video before there were music videos you know uh, this was right before mtv what kind of came along what, what year are, are we talking about what what specific year i went into nyu in 79 okay. 79 yeah, 79 80 81 so um uh yeah so that's um uh, how that started and um, met Spike there and, and, and I went in as a cinematography major. So I either wrote and directed my own stuff or I shot other people's films. Mm. I really concentrated on that. The, the, and, the, but the, the photography side, well, that, that really stuck. Some Something about that. Yeah, you... you uh... Well, that was, that was my, that was my first love in, in, in film anyway. Um, you know, I, I I was always interested why certain when I was a kid I always wondered why certain movies looked the way they did, and um, and my uncle who was probably one person who helped me make the decisions in my life that I made, um, he would do black and white stills and he made some beautiful black and white prints and we used to sit up late at night and watch old movies, and one night we we're sitting up good. watching. One night we're sitting up watching David Lean's Oliver Twist. And that's one of the movies that I always wondered, why does it look that way? And my uncle said, you know, we're looking at it. And he just remarked, yeah, damn, this photography is amazing. Oh, movies are photographed. Mm. Okay. So then I started really checking out who this person called the director of photography was. And really getting into that. And... Um, and were there early on were there particular uh, directors of photography who who you you gravitated toward were there guys yeah i think the first name that i i knew was conrad hall because conrad hall was the director of photography on the outer limits tv series and then right around the time that my uncle i was about 16 years old mm -hmm. uh when I discovered the movies of photograph. I went to the movies to see In Cold Blood. Oh, wow. Yeah. Which was photographed by Conrad Hall. And wow. that that blew me away. And then um, I started taking trips to uh, New York, you know, finding out where the film bookstores were and getting uh, issues of uh, a film magazine. And then uh, the guys that I was working with that, uh, in the medical photography section, they were also big cinematography fan. So we all had this love, you know, mm. of, of, of seeing films and um, and talking about the photography and stuff like that. So, you know, that's how it grew. And and when I went into NYU, it was funny because uh, the first day of cinematography class, it was like the class that everybody else didn't want to take, but they had to take. As soon as they saw those lenses with all the numbers around them, Everybody like freaked out. Oh my God, look at these numbers. What are we doing? I'm like, oh man, it's <laughs> it's like taking classes in, in, in theater lighting. If if you know it, some people look at, at the lights and they think, oh my God, I, what I can create with this. And 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 others think, oh I'm sitting up in, in nowheresville. I don't want to be up here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was it was easy for me because uh, I was I had already been a working photographer. So hmm. if, if, rather than taking one picture at a one picture at a time. Now I was taking twenty four pictures a second. So this is like duck meat water. Yeah, it was cool. Yeah, uh, and certainly you, you not only did you take to it, it 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 took to you. I I wasn't able to work with Spike until his second year. The great thing about Spike was that his grandmother had trust funds for all of her grandchildren, so he was able to put his trust fund into funding some of his student projects. He put it to amazing use. You know, usually it's yeah. don't spend your own money, but wow, man, he, hey, he uh, it, yeah. it has paid off handsomely. So yeah. when, you first, when you first met Spike, was he a student at NYU? Yeah, we, we, we met at the first day. First of all, we were two of the only black students there, you know, uh, but then I found out he went to Morehouse University, his undergraduate at Morehouse, and Morehouse and Howard are like um, homecoming football 
rivals. Yeah. yeah. And Howard always beat Morehouse, Morehouse's butt at the homecoming football games. So, you know, we started, you know, joking about our schools. But then we started talking about what we were really there for. You know, we, we were there to, to make films, to learn how to make films. Mm -hmm. And um, we talked about our dreams, you know, what we wanted to do with it one day. And, and actually, a dream that we both had was to actually someday photograph the autobiography of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. Wow. You don't know you're ever going to be able to do that, but um, ultimately it did happen. I, I hope while you were doing Malcolm X, you both had a, a, a moment at least to, to stand together and look back at that moment when you thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if? I think we probably did. I, I, I hope so, because those are very hard to come by. The Wouldn't it be cool if? And you actually get there. Yeah. Well, you know, I had already directed my first feature when Spike made the announcement that he was going to be doing Malcolm X. Mm. So I was, I had already been working, I had already uh, directed Juice, my first film. Right. And when Spike made that announcement, I said, I'm not going to let anybody else shoot that. So yeah, I yeah, went yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you took it, a step back. Yeah. And it was, um, it was just great because we had just seen the restored version of Lawrence of Arabia. Because, you know, we considered shooting Malcolm X in the 65 millimeter, you know, for a 70 millimeter print. Wow. Unfortunately, it didn't work. I mean, it didn't work out that way because for a bunch of different reasons, cost, but also the fact that no matter how good of a job I did, if the projection wasn't up to snuff, it, it would have really just, you know, messed it up. There was a movie that Tom Cruise did, it, I think, set in Ireland. Um, I forget the name of it, but that was shot in 65 millimeter. And I understand that the bad projection actually ruin that experience for a lot of people so Yikes. so you don't do that man what's up what's up man what's up you have what is commonly known as a lump head that's why i don't see too many of those these days that's one thing i do know is a human skull see you got your log heads your rock heads your water heads your arrow heads your pea heads your peanut heads and your pregnant heads what about the dickheads when Spike did his, his, his first feature, Joe's Bed-Stuy Barbershop. That was his graduate thesis. Film. His graduate thesis, but it's it's a terrific, it's really, it's a terrific movie. Ang Lee was the first AD. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because we all we all pitched in on each other's films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, you know, hey, to have, all right, Spike Lee directing, Ang Lee is the first, and you as, as, as the DP. Oh, my God. It, that's like, it's like, it's like a, a superhero movie. Well, some of the, after I got out of NYU, you know, trying to find work, uh, some of the earliest jobs I got was shooting uh, public relations films for the Archdiocese of Brooklyn, and I hired Spike as a sound man. Spike was an excellent sound man. So. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, hey, starting out. H how did John Sales find you? Well, he saw Joe's Bedside Barbershop. Joe's Bedside Barbershop played at um, a festival called New Films, New Directors in New York. I got this phone call out of the blue one day, a uh, young lady named Peggy Reisky, who was the production manager, said, hi, I'm a, my name is Peggy Reisky, I'm, I'm working, have you ever heard of John Sales? I said, yeah, John Sales at that time was the, the preeminent American independent filmmaker. Yes, indeed he she was, said, uh, totally. So she said, well, John is doing a, a little science fiction project, which really piqued my interest. She said, kind of like a Roger Corman-esque, kind of a thing. And um, he'd like to talk to you about it. So I went in and, and, and met with John first time. He had not written one word of script, hmm. but he sat me down and told me the entire movie. He told me the whole story hmm. from opening shots to the very final image of him on the A train in Harlem. And, uh, and it, was, it was fascinating. And, um, and he asked me if I'd ever shot 35 millimeter. I lied and said yes. <laughs> Got to do what but you I knew I could. Do. Yeah, but I knew I could handle it. I had already AC'd a, a 35 millimeter student film. So, you know, I'd, I'd say, oh man, it's the same as 16. It, yeah, the mechanics I, I, of 
Yeah, I mean, as, as you look at it, what was what really was the difference between the two? That that I mean, what was the challenge between the two? Yeah. It was, uh, you know, uh, just a larger camera. So I I got it, and we shot it in twenty four days. It was a little twenty four day movie, and um, I got uh, one of my friends at NYU, Frank Frenzy, to be my AC, and um, and we did it together. I had so much respect for John and his producer, his uh, his lady producer, Maggie, Maggie Renzi. Because, you know, we all work for Deferred. We all work Deferred. And, you know, word was, you work Deferred, forget about it. You're never going to see the rest of your money. Mm. But the crew was invited to the opening night screening. And John and Maggie were standing outside the theater with envelopes for everybody. So... Mm. It paid everybody off, which was which was really beautiful, wow. and, and it, it was it was it was a great experience. You know, we um, it was a tough little shoot. My first one, I had uh, I had a really nervous day one day because after the first day of shooting, I thought it went pretty good, but then I'm driving to the I drove to the set for the second day, and I saw that John and Maggie and Peggy were in a huddle and it looked like something was wrong, and I. Walked up and I said, uh, hey, everything okay? I said, call the lab immediately. We got problems. I said, really? So I called the lab. And I and it was Movie Lab in New York. And uh, I think the guy, I think the, the guy's name was Norm. And Norm said, oh, Ernest, hey, baby. I, hey, uh, I don't know what to tell you, kiddo. You're going to have to reshoot everything you did yesterday. I said, what? He said, you're going to have to reshoot everything, man. It's, um, it's no good, man. Your HMIs are flickering all over the place. I said, Norm, we can't afford HMIs. I did not have any HMIs. Everything was bounce cards. Everything was reflectors. So I went to Peggy and I said, do me a favor. Have them. I hate to have it printed again. I hate to run the negative through um, the printer again, but have them do another print. And they did. And it was fine. Apparently, the guy that was doing the printing that night, um, I don't know, maybe he was drinking or something, but he had the wrong shutter setting on the printer. And so it had like a strobing effect. So whew, on your first feature, after that, you know, you you know, you know, think your career is over before it even got started. So. But it worked out. And we're, we're quite glad it did. Yeah, me too. In 1984, you did a, uh, you DP'd another movie. Well, Desiree. Yeah. Desiree. You do Desiree and the next thing you're, you are, man, you're, you're in demand. You're, you're working. You do uh, a little work on Day of the Dead. Yeah, because uh, I, because Brother of Another Planet got me um, uh, Tales from the Dark Side. Right. I was I, I was on the New York crew on Tales from the Dark Side. There were two two cinematographers. So you were in touch with with Romero that way. Well, actually, it was Michael Gornick who was Romero's director of photography that got me uh, Day of the Dead. Um, I wound up shooting uh, an episode that he directed. And, you know, we got along. We got along really cool. And he asked me, hey, you want to come down and shoot some second unit on Day of the Dead? I said, yeah. Now, you're, you're, a, you're a movie guy at this point. Were you a horror movie guy in any particular way at this point? Yeah, I kind of always have been. Okay. I've always been a big fan of the horror and science fiction. Okay. Uh, and I think the earliest movie I can ever remember seeing was It Came From Beneath the Sea. You know, the Ray Harryhausen movie about the China. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I talking with Joe Dante, it came out in 1955 when I was about four years old. So, yeah, that makes sense. I remember seeing it in Boston mm. on a double bill with another movie called The Creature with the Adam Brain. With and the Joe Adam Dante. Brain. Yeah. And, and, and there were two movies made by Columbia, wow. Sam Katzman. And uh, Creature with the Adam Brain scared the living daylights out of me because I was like four years old, you know. But um, just but yeah, the title my, alone is, is terrifying. It's yeah, it's still a pretty effective movie. Huh. But my my cousins loved horror films, so they would take me to see movies like The Tingler, and I was a teenage Frankenstein. Um, I saw Pit and the Pendulum, one of the few movies that made me really like hide my eyes behind my hands was The Pit and the Pendulum. Huh. Um, and um. You know, just saw a lot of uh, Universal horror films, Tarantula. You know, all those movies on Saturday matinee. All right, so working horror was 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 a natural place where you were going to end up anyway. 
Yeah, and I was also reading horror and science fiction as well. Because I read, I, I got in trouble reading 1984 because I was thinking it was a science fiction film, which, I mean, a science fiction novel, which it was because it was futuristic. Because, you know, we're talking about the early 60s when I read it. So, um, so that was just like one that I read, you know. Uh, but I was always reading, and I read a lot of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Ray Bradbury was somebody who really blew me away. I think the Martian Chronicles really, uh, really hit me pretty heavily. Hmm. But then one uh, Christmas, my mother, as a Christmas present, one of the presents she gave me was Dracula by Bram Stoker. And I read that. Scared the shit out of me. It really, it was so creepy. Yeah. Uh, you, you worked with Spike again on She's Gotta Have It. Uh, mm-hmm. And again, like I mentioned, that's just got a fantastic opening sequence with, with the Brooklyn Bridge. That's just a great bunch of shots. Do the right thing. That That's a, that's a really special movie because you, it's 30 some odd years ago and it is not lost an iota of relevance, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's still pressure today. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a good experience because um, basically we were on just one block for the, oh, what was it? I think it was like 40 days. I think we shot it in 40-something days. Hmm. And, um, and it was one block. All the interiors were homes, you know, uh, uh, apartments on that block. Um, it, it's got a really yeah. bright palette, though. You, you really went, you know, there's, well, con- considering... The, the 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 there's a darkness underneath the whole thing. The it's really bright in a lot of places. Yeah. Well, you know, really wanted to try and find ways of using color to tell story because, uh, you know, in still photography, I was always black and white was fine, but I really, really was attracted to a lot of colorists, a mm-hmm. lot of color photographers, and uh, color cinematographers, especially people like Jack Cardiff who use color expressionistically and, um, and Gordon Willis, who use color expression. Mm-hmm. And so I remember when you say they use it express ex- expressionistically, uh, yeah. for the benefit of our, our audience, what, what are they seeing when, when a, when a DP works expressionistically? Using color, not necessarily realistically, but to get an emotional response from the audience and, cool. uh, and also to get the audience to, feel the way the characters are feeling in the movie. When Spike and I were flying to, to LA to do the answer print for um, the final print for school days, and he was writing something at that time, it was called Heat Wave. And we're sitting in the, in the plane and he's writing Heat Wave and, mm. and he says, hey, I want you to think about the best ways visually to get the audience to feel the heat of the hottest day of the summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that got me thinking about color. Right and, colors, and um, and also limiting the color more to the yellows and the reds and the oranges, more the orange, the the, the yellow side of the spectrum. Staying away from blues, because um, I, I read in, I read that in submarines, most submarine interiors are usually kind of green or blue to have a calming effect for the guys that are inside the submarines. Red actually has an effect where it does increase your heart rate. Looking at red does increase your heart rate and it causes uh, agitation so what i was able to do they gave me a whole month of of paid pre-production before we went to camera so i could make some pretty heavy decisions on on how to do this because another problem we had was that over a period of uh, 40 days i had to make it look like one day because the whole movie takes place on one day right so i was able to you know, just lay down, you know, lay, look, whatever street we shoot on, it has to run north and south. Because as the sun travels from east to west, one side of the street is, is going to be in shade. Mm-hmm. So it's easier for me to make a cloudy day look like the shaded side of the street because there was no way I was going to be able to light up the whole street. Mm-hmm. So um, so we were able to do that. And that's how we, we locked in on that neighborhood. And um I made a deal with the people in the neighborhood. Uh, when Thomas, the production designer, made a deal where they would actually fix up some of the homes there, which um, you know, just to make the neighborhood a little bit, a little bit nicer than it actually was. And he built the pizza parlor 
on on the corner. There was a it was a vacant lot there on the corner, and he was able to put the pizza parlor there. So that worked out great because it was uh, one location. Uh, a lot of times, um, what we were going to shoot that day was determined by what the weather was. But we never had to travel. You know, the only the, the teamsters were kind of mad at us because <laughs> the, the only teams that was really working regularly was the guy who was taking the film and taking equipment and picking up some of the actors. You know, but we weren't moving. The truck stayed in one place. I had to go into old style technology to get to really try and duplicate sunlight. I bought out arcs, which mm. had gone out of use. I bought back uh, the big brute arcs uh, to create sunlight because I felt that gave me a better recreation of sunlight than, um, than uh, HMIs. So, so it worked out okay. And it was a hot summer anyway, so, so that helped. A couple of years ago, the New Yorker, a guy named Richard Brody wrote in New York the, about the enduring urgency of Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing at 30. Uh, he pointed out that uh, Do the Right Thing was released the same year as Driving Miss Daisy, which won the Oscar Best Picture, uh, and Lee's film wasn't even nominated. Uh, today, the industry mainstream or whatever's left of it is at least superficially more diverse and sometimes substantially so, uh, as with Creed and Black Panther. But some things haven't changed. Lee's uh, Black Klansman, which was a Best Picture nominee this year, lost out to Green Book. Mm. <laughs> Another regressive tale of, of interracial friendship. It's... Yeah. Yeah, but who remembers those movies? Yeah. Nobody yeah. really remembers Driving Miss Daisy. I mean, you know, it's not, it's never, it's never talked about in terms of films that really made an impact. Right. Uh, Green, Green right. Book. I think, you know, wound up having the same problems in that uh, the family of the of the character that uh, Mahir Shala Ali played, they said that that wasn't even an accurate portrayal of him. So, but that always happens. So, but um, yeah, you know, um, that's been a problem in, in a lot of Hollywood films. You know, sometimes they're, they're afraid to confront um, uh, hard subjects straight on and you know and us, yeah. they want to end up hurting themselves by doing that no better blues jungle fever malcolm x as you said but you had already worked as a director on juice uh now this was a, a script that, that you wrote yeah i co-wrote it with um a, a a friend of mine a guy i had gone to howard with gerard brown and when, uh, when did the idea first start percolating the idea first started percolating after I completed my first year at Howard University, hmm. uh, because I stayed in Washington, D.C. after the year. I got a job at the post office for the summer to make some money. I had an apartment in the city, had a job at the post office. So I had to check in every morning by 6.59 a.m. And a lot of times, taking the bus in the morning, I would see kids hanging out on the bus. Kids looked like they had been out all night long, getting <laughs> into who knows what, you know. They looked like they probably had adventures all night long, probably getting into all kinds of mischief. And I just, and I just said, there's a, you know, there's a movie there. Um, and, and I didn't know what it was at that time. And then after I graduated from, after I got out of uh, NYU, um, you know, I spent a lot of time when I wasn't working. I had gotten married. My wife was working. And uh, and I started writing uh, the first draft of uh, Juice. And uh, Gerard was a playwright. He had actually, he was actually a writer in residence at Joe Papp's Public Theater in Manhattan. Um, and so, you know, he had a play that was, uh, that was, uh, playing there called Jonan. And, um, and so I wrote the first draft of Juice and then Gerard wrote the second and then I wrote the third draft, turning it more into the movie that I wanted to see it as. And um, we wrote it to think, you know, to try and debut ourselves as a, as a writer-director team. And uh, figured, okay, if we ever get to do this, we'll probably do it for like several thousand dollars, shoot in 16 millimeter and blow it up. And uh, my agent at the time, I took it to him and um, uh, 
Everybody said, nah, nobody wants to see this. You're never going to get this made. Um, I showed it to a lot of people, people whose opinions I really, I really uh, trusted. And they said, no, nobody wants to see this. This is just too dark, Ernest. Why don't you lighten it up, you know? But, um, and so it wound up sitting on the shelf for the longest time. It wound up sitting on the shelf, I think, until around 90, I think around 90. Mm-hmm. Um, my career as a cinematographer was doing okay at that time. But Gerard was, was uh, auditioning another agent, and she wanted to see a film that he had written. So he showed her Juice. And she was like, whoa, what, 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 why is this, what's going on with this? And he said, nothing, nobody, you know, we could get no traction on it. Everybody said, forget about it. You'll never get this made. Um, All it took was a fan. And, and she says, I can get this set up immediately. And so she took it to several production companies. And um, uh, actually the company that seemed to be the most interested was uh, Dick Donner's company, Donner Shula Donner. You know, they gave me a list of uh, uh, three pages of, of potential directors Mine was the last name on on the third page. Gerard and I said, okay, well, maybe we'll sell it. You know, maybe it'll be okay. And then we started getting notes. We started getting notes that it was uh, it was way too dark, that maybe we needed to think about rewriting it as a comedy. So we more... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, development hell. Okay, okay, thanks, guys. At that time, Gerard and I were seeing movies on HBO, movies that had a good central premise, but looked like it just got developed into a piece of shit. And and the notes they were giving us, who they wanted to act in it, you know, mostly, you know, a lot of, you know, young black actors, kids who were on television from television. Hmm. I love Malcolm Jamal Warner, and I know he was one of the names that was given to us, but um, but it wasn't the same thing because, you know, I thought of uh, Juice as a film noir. You know, it's 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 noirish, and I and I had to keep that. Hmm. But Gerard and I had a real heavy conversation, and we and we we said, look, this is turning into something we would never want our names on. Let's just take it back and just forget sucks about when it. That, sucks when that happens, doesn't it? Yeah. So we we took it back. We said thank you, but we we don't want to do this. And life went on until I got a phone call one day from a British gentleman named David Heyman, hmm. who told me that uh, he read my script and he wanted to talk to me about how I saw it. And so we had breakfast in the village, uh, Greenwich Village. Uh, uh, I don't know if the restaurant is still there called the Pink Teacup. Great soul food place. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he asked me how I saw the movie. And, um, and I told him, I said, it's got to be raw. It's got to be real. I said, it's got to be shot all on location. You know, there's, you know we, we can't do any studio in this. Um, who do I see acting in it? I don't know. I think we got to go after unknowns. I said, I don't want, you know, I don't want to bring any actors in that are going to bring any kind of preconceived baggage to the film. And we had a great conversation. And at the end of it, he says, uh, well, I like what you had to say about it. You want me to get um, funding for it? Well, David Heyman's father was John. Sir John Heyman, who's who I knew very well. Yeah, who was um, partners with Chris Blackwell in Island, Island Records and their offshoot was Island Pictures. And it was Island Pictures that wound up funding Juice to the tune of uh, $3 million. Did you ever meet John? Yeah, 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 I did. He was, did you he meet was, uh, David's mother, Norma? I don't think I ever met, I don't think I ever met David's mother. Uh, I, they I, remember, were, I think they were separated by then, but Norma was a, was, a, was a force in film as well. But John was this powerhouse um, that, you know, I think years, actually maybe around when you were talking, what you're talking about, he was like a very big uh, part of financing Paramount. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I met him through that a long, long time ago. Well, he was, he was very supportive. He came to the set a couple of times. I remember, I remember our last day, our last night of shooting, he got us a really wonderful wrap dinner. I mean, lobster, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know really. And, you know, really very supportive of David, because for David, this was his first outing yeah. as a producer. He was partnered with uh, Neil Moritz and Peter Frankfurt. They actually shot the movie in, in a strike because the deal was made before the strike went into effect. And so we were at that time the highest budget of film shooting in New York. Sure. But the cast was totally unknown. The only, the only uh, actor who had been in a film before was Jermaine Hopkins. 
Mm. And you uh, had a, a, an unknown guy named named Tupac. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tupac came in to read. He was a total unknown. Yeah. He came, he actually came in hanging out with Tretch from Naughty by Nature. Mm. And um, he, and I was having he, he was just riding. He was just riding along. Yeah, he was just hanging out. And I just said, "What about you, man? You want to read?" He said, "Yeah, sure." And I gave him the sides for for the, the role that went to Omar Epps first. Yeah. And he went away, came back and, and did a pretty good job. But we were having a hard time finding a really good bishop. And I asked him if he could stay longer and then read the bishop sides. And he did and came back and, and really just went away. <laughs> Always will be. That, that's like the and, monster uh, of the piece. That, that's, that's, that's the trickiest role of all. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing about it. A lot of guys made the mistake of just coming in and just going ballistic and just being a monster. Yeah. No, but, don't but play the monster. Play against the monster. Yeah. Well, there's pain. The mon- he's a monster because of the pain inside of him. And Tupac knew that. <laughs> Look at this. The brother finally decides to stand up like a man and throw down. Too bad Raheem had to die first, huh? It's over. Everything starts from now. We all go down unless we stay together. Ain't no one man above the crew. You know that shit. Crazy, man. You know what? When you said that last time, I was kind of tripping, right? But now, you right. I am crazy. But you know what else? I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck about you. I don't give a fuck about Steel. And I don't give a fuck about Raheem either. I don't give a fuck about myself. Look, I ain't shit. I ain't never gonna be shit. And you less of a man than me, so as soon as I decide that you ain't gonna be shit, pow. So be it. You remember that, motherfucker. And what, what's really interesting is that I found out later that he is acting at the at the Baltimore School of the Performing Arts, and he was uh, a, a trained actor and a trained and, and he actually done some ballet, trained in ballet, which was really interesting. So he, um, he does move really gracefully. Yeah, his really? he always walked, people always played. Mm-hmm. You know, they were always kind of played mm-hmm. out, mm-hmm. and it was and it was so interesting because when we were shooting Juice, a lot of time he always had a notebook. And he would always sometimes go in a corner and sit and write. But he always had this fascination with people that, you know, he would always see somebody that looked interesting or maybe looked like they had something going on with them, maybe a problem, a lady or somebody. And he'd go over and talk to them. He, met, he talked to a lot of people. And I like to think that that wound up in his music. There was a lot of history. You know, Khalil Kane's uh, father was one of the last poets, you know, which was a, a big... Uh, uh, a big sensation in the 60s uh, in the New York area. And uh, Omar was a senior in high school trying to decide if he was going to go into acting or if he was going to um, uh, have this, you know, try and stay with this little musical group, singing group that he was part of. And seems to, It uh, seems to have worked out for Omar. Yeah. And Jermaine had already been on uh, Lean On Me with uh, Morgan Freeman. So he already had some uh, some uh, film experience behind him. And I actually met him when I shot a pilot for a, an NBC series. And he played uh, this young kid. And we hit it off because we were both from Newark, New Jersey. And so he was my homeboy. So finding those four guys, uh, we started out by going to all the high schools of the performing arts and local theater groups and church theater groups. And and uh, my casting director, Jackie Brown Carmen, she went through so many people. And we gradually narrowed it down to like 12 guys. And then I did mixing and matching to mm-hmm. see where who, which four guys could create the fifth guy. I wanted those four characters to become a fifth character, which was like the group mind. I wanted them to really be the crew. And those guys really hit it off. And so that's how we started. Plays, you, you, you feel the chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they, they hung out 
after after work, you know, even after we finished shooting, they would hang out. I think Omar actually went on tour with uh, Tupac for a little bit. Come to find out years later, when we, because we've been talking with um, Tupac's uh, management, the people that manage his estate, that they were trying to talk him, they were trying to get him to do a record around the same time that we um, that we shot you. So he was being pushed on two different fronts by his management team and by us um, in, in the movie to start an acting career. So, uh, and it's amazing. So we're still in touch with those folks. But just um, the other day, um, Tupac got his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Yeah. And we were there for that. So that was long overdue, but finally. You're here. Uh, as as a, now you're the first time as a director you you have to hire the DP. What mm -hmm. what did you look for when you hired Larry Banks? What, what 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 did you want in your DP? Well, Larry has been a gaffer for me. Larry uh, Larry was my gaffer on um, on school days, and uh, and he had been shooting music videos. Um, so I wanted somebody that I knew, somebody that. Uh, Mm -hmm. you know uh that i knew pretty well and so that's how larry got that gig it was crazy because uh larry larry was the cinematographer and he hired his cousin andre as the gaffer and andre <laughs> older than larry <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> so it was almost like the younger brother trying to tell the older brother what to do and the older brother saying no, i don't want to do it that way <laughs> it was it was really funny the way those guys got together but um yeah but larry um you know, I knew Larry as, as you know, he asked for me uh, for that and, and several other jobs. So, you know, and I enjoyed working with him. You you did really well with, with Juice. Roger Ebert gave the film three out of four stars. He praised the film as one of those stories with the quality of a nightmare. Mm. Uh, Entertainment Weekly gave the film a B plus. Uh, let's see. The film is an inflammatory morality play shot through with rage and despair, like Boys in the Hood and Straight Out of Brooklyn. That's from Rotten Tomatoes. Mm. Uh, they uh, also say on Rotten Tomatoes that coming out from behind Spike Lee's camera, Ernest Dickerson, that's you, has instantly arrived at the forefront of the new wave of black directors. His film aims for the gut and hits it. Bravo. Well, we try. Bravo. We tried. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So then you do a thing called Surviving the Game. Uh, you had both Rutger Hauer and Gary Busey in your cast. <laughs> Are you out of your fucking mind? And you survived. And F. Murray Abraham. Well, honestly, I was, I was scared to work with Rutger. You know, um, I think when we found out he was available and was interested, I said, okay, I got to meet him, you know, and, and everybody said, watch out for Rucker Howard. He could be, he's a handful. And uh, so I, I agreed to meet with him. I think it was the MGM hotel in, in Santa Monica, right down there by the water. I think it was the MGM, I forget, but we met and he came in, he'd been riding his motorcycle. He came in, we sat in the bar. We talked for like four and a half hours. Huh. We just rapped. We just rapped. I I I loved Rucker Man. That that dude was so cool. He's just one of those guys that just had a a low tolerance for bullshit, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know he I had been to Amsterdam, you know, which was where he was from, um, and Curacao, which I had already been going to. Curacao uh, was a Dutch colony until 2010. And so uh, the Dutch experience. So uh, Rucker was just so cool. Rucker was great. Gary Busey um, was was really interesting because um, when I first met him, and I knocked on his door, and um, and I said, "Hey, Gary, I'm Ernest Dickerson, the director." He said, "Do you know about the hole in my head?" And he and he took my hand and he had me feel this hole that he got in his head from this motorcycle act. And um, and you know. Really interesting. You're trying to figure it out. What was really interesting about Gary was that he really didn't at first didn't know what to do with that character, and um, because the scene at the dinner table was a scene that I asked the writer to write because I wanted a scene like my favorite 60s 
seen in Jaws where the guys are sitting in the boat and talking about their scars and comparing their scars. And then uh, Robert Shaw got into that great thing about the Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. So, um, Mm -hmm. so the writer Eric Burnt wrote this great scene for me and, you know, and uh, Gary was was having a heart. He said, it's just a crazy story I'm telling about this dog and, and his dog is out in the woods. And, and and, and, I mean, how do I, I mean, is, is this funny? I said, no, Gary, it's not funny. I mean, I mean, we're, I mean, damn, how do I treat, how do I treat this? I said, well, Gary, let me tell you where it came from. It's a true story that came from an account of a young man who grew up as a white supremacist up in Idaho. And this is what his father did to him. He, he, ra- he raised his son in the woods with this dog. He loved this dog. One day the dog disappeared. And two weeks later, the dad comes to him and says, come on, son, we're going out into the woods. Goes out into the woods. There's a shed out in the woods. And he could just hear this growling inside the shed. And his father basically told his son, he said, look, your dog's in that shed. He has not eaten in two weeks. Your dog is hungry and he's crazy. I'm going to put you in there with that dog. I only want to see one of you come out of there alive. So when I told that to Gary, he said, oh, my God. He ran around the room. And he said, really? I said, yeah, Gary. And he like ran around. And he said, oh. He said, Ernest, you really watered my garden. <laughs> so I watered Gary Busey's garden to the point where sometimes while we were shooting, Two o'clock in the morning, he would call me up and say, Ernest, I've been thinking about that, you know, that line, you know, he really got into it. He was, he you, was, you, uh, you had a drip line installed too, apparently. <laughs> so every Saturday afternoon, I got behind a little dummy my dad built and I'd toss these cherry bombs and M80s at the dog. Boom, boom. That dog was scared at first, but after a while he got angry and he would come at the dummy. <laughs> He'd get the dummy and rip it apart. Head was off, shirt was gone. So, 13 years old, birthday time, got me a 12-gauge shotgun. <laughs> We're going hunting. I was so excited. We went out in the clearing in the woods. My dad laid his gun down, took my gun and laid it down and said, son, today you're going to learn to control your emotions. You're going to do things that some men are unable and unwilling to do. Follow me. I followed my dad. We went around a clump of trees. There's a little corral built. There's Prince Henry Stout chained in the middle of the corral. My dad took out a pocket full of cherry bombs and put them in my hand and said, get in the corral. Here's a lighter. I want you to light those cherry bombs and throw them at the prince. You're going to face manhood. You're going to fight that dog to the death. He's going to kill you or you're going to kill him. Now! You could tell he was enjoying that role. He really um, went all the way. He, he has his process. Yeah. Well, he... On his death scene, we could only do one take because they were getting ready to pull the plug on me for that day. Um, And uh, we could only do one take. And Gary wanted to pay. He said uh, he he wanted to pay for the overtime to give him another take. He wanted another take. I wanted another take. Fred Caruso, my producer, said, "I, I, I can't give it to you. I don't I don't have the money for it. Because what happened was that one of the things that happened Four days into the shooting, uh, Murray, we were shooting um, in Wenatchee, Washington, which was on the other side of the Cascade Mountains, about a four-hour drive away from Seattle, Mm -hmm. and really dark country mountain roads and everything. And one night, Murray was decided to drive himself home instead of having the driver drive him home. And those country roads had no no street lamps, and there was this one road crossing with the stop sign pointing the other way not murray and murray went through and this car like ran through the stop sign rammed into murray's car wow on the passenger side on the passenger side so he was driving if he'd been on the passenger side he would have gotten killed he was he was was on the driver's side his car was spun over to the other side of the road his face went into the steering wheel which dinged his face he broke three fingers in one hand and, and and broke three ribs. The driver in the other car was killed. I think I think when the other person in the car with him was killed, one other person had to be had to be uh, medevaced out. They had to bring in a helicopter to, to airlift him out. The inside of that car was filled with uh, empty empty uh, beer cans and, and and wine bottles. So so this was like on the fourth day of shooting, 
And um, and we had this heavy scene to do in the woods. If you ever see the movie, after the first chase, you'll notice that Murray kind of like stays in the background and doesn't say anything. Yeah. Because while Murray was in the hospital, I had to shoot with his stunt double. And his stunt double had, had goggles on and, um, and, and didn't say a word. We took all of his dialogue away. So, um, and... So Murray had to wear black gloves because he had a cast on one hand. Oh boy! Uh, 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 uh. And gloves and everything. And he, even though his his manager was telling him, "Look, just quit. You know, just just quit the production. You know, insurance will take care of everything. Let let, let them worry about it. Let insurance." Murray said, "No, I can't do that, man. I can't. I." I he said, if I'm going to be sitting someplace, I'm going to be thinking what almost happened to me. I'm going to be thinking I almost got killed. So I got to work. So God bless him. I love Murray because he came to work. And um, and he had a hard time because he was taking drugs, you know, and, and he had the broken hand and he had the, the three broken ribs. So he could only do maybe like one or two takes and he'd have to take a rest. So we were getting way behind schedule. And um, my producer, Kevin Messick, you know, he flew back to L.A. because we were at New Line, flew back to L.A. to try and get more money. And come to find out that basically this movie was the last part of a deal between New Line and David Permit Presentations. I guess they started out as friends, but by the time it came to surviving the game, they were like mortal enemies. They were dogging each other in the print every single day. So basically, surviving the game was a, a contractual fulfillment. And what happened with me was based on my cast, pre-sales overseas, they had already made their money back before we even went to camera. Mm. Because, you know, because it had Charles Dutton, yeah. F. Murray Abraham, Oscar winner, you know, Gary Busey, Rucker Howard. And so, you know, poor Murray, he had to just, uh, you know, he he hung in there, man. He really hung in there. That's why I I really love that guy. Hmm. And and uh, Rucker was was so cool. <laughs> you know, Rucker was an interesting guy. You know, he he and Charles Dutton developed this interesting relationship with you know which they play in the movie which, you know, look at it and figure out what's going on there. But the idea, they used to be two CIA killers, yeah. and they were trying to fix their way of staying in business. But um, Rucker would come up with some interesting concepts, you know, because when he first saw the cabin that was um, that was built by Christian Wagner, who wound up being my production designer on, um, on Demon Knight, yep. uh, he came in and he saw that everything that I wanted in that cabin, I wanted everything in that cabin to be something that had once been alive. So it was it was wood. The tables were wood. Sure. Even sure. even even the uh, the trash can was like a hollowed out elephant's foot, you know, and 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 preserved. You know, everything was was alive. So Rucker came in and and you know he said, well maybe maybe we should have some flowers on the mantelpiece. Maybe like white, you know, white flowers, like white roses and stuff like that. I said, oh, no. no, it's not going to go with the color scheme. I mean Rucker. Some of his ideas were good. Some of his ideas weren't. He just had to have a good, a good, uh, good reason for saying no. Mm. But he was, he was so cool. He, uh, Murray wanted to um, thank the cast, thank the crew for being so patient with him while he was working under pain. So he, he bought out a restaurant and, and threw a party. And the one thing you had to do to get into the party, you had to wear something red. So, you know, most folks, they got like a, a red handkerchief or a red tie, you know, a red this and that. Rucker had the best idea. He had some young lady with red lipstick kiss him all over his face. <laughs> and he showed it with all these these red kiss marks all over his face. And, um, you know, really, really, really cool gentleman. Really. And Murray was cool. You know, the great thing about Murray was that every day you come to work, you eat. He expects you to have a, a dirty joke for him because he will have one for you. So he expects you to have one for him. Oh, so, when I, so when I read in the papers like several weeks ago how he was, you know, somebody was calling out improper behavior on the set or something. I said, I bet you, it's, I bet you it's Murray with his dirty jokes. 
<laughs> you know, I, I work with Murray. I work with Murray as well. And, yeah. and uh, you know, before, when I wanted to hire him, everyone said, oh, the guys who are financing the movie, when I say everyone, they said, oh, you don't want Murray. He's, he's very difficult and he's very bitter and he's very this and very that. And I said, no, no, I, I really want Murray because I, I, I think he's a wonderful actor and I'll, I'll deal with the problems if there are any problems. I, I, so Murray comes, actually, I, was, I, should, I was shot in Vancouver. Murray comes to Vancouver. Wait, what, what, what was the project? Um, oh, God, was uh, thir uh 13 Ghosts? I think 13 Ghosts, yeah. Yeah, okay. And so oh, okay. he comes to Vancouver and he's in wardrobe and I go in to say hello and we, we greet each other. And I said, um, you know, this isn't the first time we've met. And he goes... And I said, no, don't, don't, don't be upset. I, I don't expect you to remember. Um, you were working for Joe Papp in a, in a theater production. And I explained the story to him because I started out in theater. And I, you know, I mean, Joe Papp was a god to me, as was Jules Irving at Lincoln Center. And, mm -hmm. and we became attached at the hip because of, of my theater background. And so anytime he had a problem, he wouldn't talk to anybody. He would say, just get Gil. I need to talk to Gil about this. And I would come in and I go, what's the problem? What's the matter? And he would say what the issue was. And I would go, oh, okay. So, so have you spoken to the director about the solution? And da, 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 da. and within 10 minutes, it was solved. You know, yeah. so it, it was the same thing. It was just, he was the nicest gentleman in the world. And, you know, we always, we always found a way. And, and uh, I really enjoyed working with him and I've always wanted to work with him again. Yeah, me too. Me too. I, I, I love seeing it. I'm glad he's seems like he's having a bit of a resurgence and I'm glad yeah. to see that. In a big oh, way. Kind of, yeah. 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 No, we had a we had fun though. It was uh it was cool. It was cool. Yeah. So suddenly it gets into the into Universal's head and, and the Crypt partners' heads to start making Tales from the Crypt feature films. And the first the idea that it was, yes. Yeah. <laughs> The first, the first movie that that they wanted to do was was Demon Knight. Uh, Gil did not want to direct that, and so he stepped back. Do you? Before we hired Ernest Gil, who else did we have in mind? Do do, do you remember? I think Rutger Hauer. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> and it comes full circle. The story. Yeah. That's weird. Um, no, I don't. I don't recall. I. I only remember Ernest. I remember. No, I don't remember any other names. In I do, I don't remember, it was just. It's like. Maybe. I remember Joel coming to me one at one point, or he summoned me to his office and closed the door. And I'm thinking, oh god, now what? Now what are we going to fight about? And he said, uh, you know this guy. You know this guy, Ernest Dickerson. And I, you know, for the life of me, I was like. Um, is it animal, vegetable, or mineral? <laughs> yeah. And I said, um, "There's a the, the director," and he and he said, "Yeah, the director." You know, like, what do you what do you think I'm talking about? And I said, "Yeah, you know him? No. How come you don't know him?" Which is a hard question to answer. Right? <laughs> yeah. And and he said, "You got to, you got to get to know him, and you got to meet him because you know." And, and that was the beginning of it. Yeah, I remember. I remember coming in for a meeting at first um, at Warner Brothers. Yeah, it was Warner Brothers. I think the first meeting was. Yeah. Yeah. And then Probably I got Joel's. Yeah, yeah. And then I got uh, you and Alan in to see when we were doing, when we were looking at the final sound mix of Surviving the Game. Exactly. Maybe yeah. you guys came in and saw it. Yeah. So you could see what what I had just done. I think I asked you, Gil. I I think I asked you, is there any way we could shoot this on a stage? Because I think what, what was it 40 40 days but but it was going to be all nights and i just knew that shooting all nights was going to be murder and um and i know that's that's uh that's how we found the uh, airplane hangar dude, oh, yeah. at uh, van Huyen airport yeah. yeah and i think that was one of the best things ever but uh it gave we, us total control we we needed the clearance because of the it, it was a, it was a two uh a, a two uh two floor set mm -hmm. yeah and um, and Christian designed and built it uh, so that it could be basically seen from the outside from one angle and then uh, go right inside. Yeah, it was it was a really fun set to work in. So who, and, says, uh, who says producers don't often listen to their director's requests? <laughs> well, I, I, I remember having a lot of fun 
on that shoot, as difficult as it was, because because there's no such thing as an easy shoot. Right. But, um, but you 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 gave me some memorable moments. Um, <laughs> I remember when I had to audition uh, the young ladies for Uncle Willie's dream sequence. <laughs> And um, and I remember eating it. I remember eating lunch, and I think I had kung pao chicken. <laughs> eating kung pao chicken while these ladies were coming in and unstripping, you know, taking their clothes off and showing me, you know, what they were and all that other stuff. And and I think you set that up, Gil. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, it, it was like wait, wait, lunch in the show. Be, wait a minute, just to be clear, I set up the girls or the kung pao chicken. <laughs> I think the whole situation. <laughs> I, think, I think you made it part of my lunch hour, huh. but uh, no, but it was it was great. It was um, you know the cast came together really really well. Um, yeah. I remember I, I was surprised to find out that, that Billy Zane was bald, and I had seen him in that uh, that Australian film where they were on the boat. Dead calm, dead calm with with uh, uh... and I thought he was excellent in that. So I thought, yeah, that worked. Uh, <laughs> and you know we were able to get Dick Miller, it, which yeah. was it's funny. Let, let's, let's go back to, to Billy Zane for a second. I, I had actually met Billy Zane a bunch of years before. Mm. Uh, I I went to Vassar, and uh, my last year I was in a production of Cab a Brechtian production of Cabaret. I was the male lead, and the female lead was an actress named Lisa Zane, who was a professional actress. I think she still works occasionally, uh, but her brother. At that time, she was the older sister and her younger brother, Billy Zane, came to visit from Chicago when we put up our production of of uh, of Cabaret at, at Vassar. And uh, in the subsequent years, I noticed that Billy went from being the younger brother to the older brother. Yeah. I, I'm not quite sure how, how, how they pulled this off, but it's a miraculous thing. Uh, one last note on Billy Zane. Uh, he he was 16 years old. He was really a, he was a good looking kid. Really, uh, he ended up sleeping with one of my roommate's girlfriends. Oh, okay, whoa. Who did you play in cabaret? Did you play MC or did you play? Uh... I played the the male lead in in it's it's I guess in, in, in the movie version it would be the the Michael York character, but uh, okay. it, it's kind of different in in the play. It's they took away all my songs. Oh man! Oh, yeah. it, it was. They should never have cast me. They should never have cast me. You probably would have made a great MC, though. You That's know, my favorite character. But probably true. They, but but uh, the the person who we cast was great, and and uh, you know, I I was when I when I went to to Vassar, I, I had the the ludicrous idea that I was going to be be an actor. I, I went to one audition after I left Vassar, and I thought, what kind of a schmuck earns a living this way. So mm. I, I decided to become a writer instead, an even bigger schmuck. <laughs> wow. Anyway, uh, I guess we've lost Gil momentarily, but we'll, 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 we'll plot on. Do you remember the first day of shooting when, when Jada, uh, yeah, I've done yeah. set that first, that first time. Yeah, we did the, um, uh, that was, we shot the ending of the film first. Yeah. She gets on the bus. That's yeah. Right. We, yeah. Our first, our very first day, I had just seen Jada in Menace to Society, and and what I color, really what color was her hair in Menace to Society? Her hair was like dark brown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't uh, blonde. No, but actually, it you know she got it. It was platinum at first. Yeah, and she came in. You know, she told me that she, you know, before we started shooting, it was platinum. I said, I said, I got to see it. And so she came over to where I was staying and I saw, I said, Jada, I said, I said, okay, color it, please make it, make it more blonde, not platinum. I said, the platinum is too, too contrasty. I said, I can go with the blonde, you know, but just, uh, you know, but just color it, put some yellow in it. So it that's what bold, she did. It was a bold choice. Yeah. I mean, that's what she did though. But, you know, I, I loved her spunkiness in, uh, in that movie and I just thought she was, and I want somebody small, you know, and, and I thought she was ideal for Geraldine. So at the end of the day, really looking back, actually her the hair choice was was bold, but actually a good choice. Mm -hmm. it, it really makes her stand out. It's actually it's a great choice. I, absolutely. And 
I think she's perfectly cast. Perfect. Mm -hmm. She's so good in it. So good. Yeah, she was great. And, and especially especially when she comes out with all the blood on her, you know, towards the end. That was, uh, that was a lot of fun. That's right. Not my blood. <laughs> Bitch. You guys were totally, totally, totally supportive. You know, I I always tell people you're you're directors, producers. You know, at least in my case. Well, <laughs> at least in my case. You know, well, you, you you trust me to to do the job and. I was telling was telling Gil and Jeannie this that the only day I had a little bit of wondering if I was doing a good enough job was um, when we were shooting the crucifixion scene, and we had Mike Pangrazio who was doing the matte painting, and it was and it was a glass shot. It was we shooting you know old style uh, glass shot, so it was taking a while to set up. So I decided to step outside, you know, get a breath of fresh air, and I stepped outside, and who's hanging outside but Toby Hooper, <laughs> and I said. Hey, I recognize, hey, Toby Hooper, right? I recognize him from uh, reading, seeing his picture in Cine Fantastique. Yeah. And I'm saying, and inside I'm thinking, why is Toby Hooper here? <laughs> I, I think they like the dailies. Um, oh, geez. Oh, my God. You're thinking, Toby, oh, my God. He's here to take over from me, is he? <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, it turned out, no, that, that, that uh, he and Gilbert were, like, really tight. And I told Toby this years later, you know, because we became really good friends after uh, Masters of Horror. It was a great crew. And I'm I'm so happy that the film has endured for so long, you know, that people still love it. It's uh, you and I both attended a the 25th anniversary screening at uh, at the at the Cinerama Dome. Uh, yes. It wasn't in the dome itself, but it was at uh, it, it was at, uh, at that big theater. And uh, the question and answer afterwards was 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 great fun. The, the audience has never has, has never gone away. They it, it's considered a classic. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people tell me that it's one of their favorite films, and you know, it, I'm happy to hear that. So it's, yeah, it's, it, it is hard to set out to uh, to make a horror classic. I wanted to do more like that. Uh, they don't always come along so so easily. Yeah. So uh, yeah. finding finding great material is always the challenge, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was hard for me to find my next film. Yeah. Uh, uh because it was uh I mean I was actually gonna be doing another film that was a really great story that I that I heard about and I was uh, talking with uh, Michael Henry Brown, who had written Dead Presidents and Paul Aaron, his producer, and it was uh it was a true life thriller uh, called In Too Deep. Mm. Um, and it was a true story about this guy who historically had, was undercover longer than anybody had been in history to the point where psychologically he actually became this character that he, um, that he created, you know, in order to infiltrate this, this drug gang in Boston. Mm. And, um, and he ultimately wound up committing suicide because he could not, he he was like a natural actor. He was like the ultimate method actor. And he put this into creating this this character uh, to infiltrate this drug gang. To how the could point you not want to tell this guy's story? What a great story. How, how could you not want to tell that? Well, we were having trouble setting it up. You know, we were having trouble getting getting cast for it, trouble setting it up. And, and I had bills to pay. And um, and so I got offered uh, this uh, film called um, Bulletproof. Bulletproof, yeah. With uh, Damon Wayans and Adam Sandler. And, um, you know, it was, uh, I was told, you know, okay, it's a great budget, $25 million. Hmm. And I found out later that it was $25 million with an $18 million above the line. Uh, you know, and uh, it actually wound up being one of the worst experiences I've ever had because, because um, you know, we made, it, it was a good script. It was, uh, I think Lewis Collick was the writer who had written um, uh, Mississippi Burning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a, it was a raunch, it was a hard, raunchy comedy. 
It was an adult comedy. It was an R-rated film. And we shot an R-rated film. And uh, and uh, when we had our first preview screening, and I went for the tech test, you know, to check out the, the, the test, I was kind of upset to see that they were giving out flyers to 15 and 16-year-olds to come see the screening. And the screening went well, but it was obvious that it was working for an older audience instead of a younger audience. And so that night, the, the, the mandate came down. They wanted me to recut the film and get it as close to PG-13 as I could get. Now, this is a movie where, where Adam and, and Damon, every other word out their mouth was fuck or motherfucker, you know. And uh, we had to really just butcher the movie and even cut down the relationship, the relationship between Damon and the young lady who set him up. I mean, it was supposed to be a real love affair. I, this is no joke. I went to a, a, a screening. I went to a meeting with some of the executives. And the idea that when he got shot in his head and he has to learn how to walk again, um, how the relationship with her develops, I said, you know, I my girlfriend that I had when I was at Howard University was a psychologist, was a psychiatrist, a psychi psychiatry student. And she said that the two primal deep-seated male fears are castration and losing the legs. So I said, it makes sense that after he learns how to walk, the next thing he wants to see what works is his Jimmy, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But that makes sense. And I said, and I said that that way we can have, um, you know, we can see the development of their of their relationship. So that when she betrays him at the end, it means much more. Mm. So, but they said no, no. They said, I said, but look in the script, she used a sexual blackmail against him. She says, look, if, if if you don't go after Adam, the character Adam plays, I don't think we're going to make it. So she's gets sexually blackmailing him. And this one executive said, but women don't do that. And I, excuse me, he said, no, no, he should be, he should be impotent. He should not, we should not have a love affair. He should be impotent. And I said, but you want to set up the relationship. He said, no, 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 he shouldn't have, they should not have sex. He should be impotent. And, um, and uh, I, it, it'd be too much like rewarding him. I said, no, it's, 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 it's psychologically sound. So I shot a really sensuous love scene between Damon and the young lady, but it was forced to cut it. And, um, and basically it really kind of like neutered the whole yeah. twist at the end where you find out that she has not been in love with him, that she's been working with James Caan's character and, and setting him up for this, for this, uh, for this fall. And it, you know, even I, I remember the producer telling me, he said, I want you to cut the word love out of it. They don't. She said, he said, look, our film, it gets too emotional. Our audience can't handle emotion. Oh. I said, but that's what movies are. Movies are our emotion. Our audience can't handle emotion. Can't handle it because they were they were cutting it down for a younger and younger audience. The audience that was that loved Happy Gilmore when the idea of Bulletproof was to take Adam out of the Happy Gilmore phase and into more adult comedies. Our, our paradigm was uh, 48 Hours. Hmm. That was our paradigm, you know, uh, the buddy comedy, 48 Hours, you know, which got, you know, kind of hard, hardcore, you know. And, you know, so even scenes that were, you know, with the stripper, you know, they wanted the stripper taken out. I mean, all that stuff. It was, it was really cut down. I wound up getting the worst reviews of my career. I got, I basically got raked across the coals by the critics for not having in the movie everything they told me to take out. Yeah, and, you know? and, and you're the one who, who gets who gets hung on that, and it's got nothing to do with you. Yeah, I wound up losing work after that film. So. Uh, how how not to make a movie? Yeah, yeah. Uh, TV has been incredibly good. On the other hand, yeah. You know, it was uh, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. I mean, uh, one of the first shows I was able to get involved in was The Wire. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. And you did uh, yeah. what, but nine, ten episodes. Yeah, something like that. I think eight, eight or nine. Hmm. Yeah. Um, it was. It was. Uh, I mean, it was great. I mean, you know, it was. It was just such a a great bunch of people. Uh, Nina Noble, I already knew because she had been an AD on a film that I had done, and um, and then uh, so she was producer. So uh, yeah, it was great. It was uh, great scripts. Mm. You know, Baltimore was such an interesting city. Tough shoot, but um, we're still a lot of us are still in touch with each other and still friendly, still tight. Actually, Sonia Sohn's daughter is getting married in July, so Rose and I are going to go. We have to go back east anyway, so we're going to go to her daughter's wedding. No, oh, great. That so, should be fun. But Andre Royo will be there, and 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 uh, you know a lot of the people that were in the cast will be there. So, if if by the way, when you get to the wedding, and they hand you a camera to say, "Oh, the cast is back. How about we shoot an episode? Just go get another drink." <laughs> we'll make it up. Yeah. yeah. You have also done a lot of The Walking Dead. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that was uh that was great. Um uh I forget I forget how I got I mean I I remember meeting with uh Frank Darabont and getting on it and um I don't know who else they had in that first year cuz I, I shot the next to the last episode of the first the first season which was six episodes. So I shot episode 5. I know a lot of people have problems working with Frank, but I had a great time working with him. You know, he uh, he trusted me. I know he he was kind of like looking over everybody else's shoulders, but he never looked over my shoulders. Shooting in Atlanta, outside of Atlanta, was was really interesting. Um, well, it's it's a Atlanta can be a brutal environment. It's you know because hot and humid in the summertime, yeah, and very cold and humid in the late fall and winter. Uh, I shot the the final episode of the second season, and uh, it was all night. It was shooting nights, and uh, the high was like 11 degrees. Mm-hmm. And um, and the thing about it was that all the people playing the walkers, they were all dressed for summer. So we had we had to send a couple of people home for hy- hypothermia, you know. But it was um. But yeah, it was a great crew. It was um, it was really really cool for a while. It was um, really revolutionary. Um, I had it was a great chance to work with uh, Greg Nicotero because I first worked with Greg. I first met Greg when I did second unit on uh, Day of the Dead. He was working with Tom Savini. When I worked on um, Masters of Horror, Greg was uh, doing the makeup on that, and he actually saved my butt one time. Because Masters of Horror had two seasons. They didn't get a third season. Uh, NBC picked it up as a watered-down version of a show called Fear Itself. And uh, I had to do this episode where a guy becomes a werewolf. I had Wendell, Wendell Pierce playing a, a, a veterinarian who, who gets bitten by a werewolf. And uh, he's you know, as, a, as, a, as a veterinarian as, and as a human being, he's a bit of a slob. You know, he, he he neglects his wife. He's just a slob. But after he's bitten and as he becomes a werewolf, he becomes a much better person, a better lover for his wife and everything else. But I had to have him turn into a, a, a werewolf. And <clears throat> werewolf is in the script. But then the producer tells me, we don't have the budget for a werewolf. I said, wait a minute, there's a werewolf in the script. It, 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 no, we don't have it in the budget for a werewolf. Damn. So I went to Greg Nicotero and I said, Hey man, you got any werewolves laying around? You know, I need a werewolf. And he said, what do you want it to look like? I said, I said, it's got to be a Bernie Wrightson werewolf. It's got to be a wolf standing on two legs, kind of like American werewolf in London, but but when he was like in the halfway, the halfway uh, transition, the halfway transformation. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So we went down to the, down to the studio, went down to his uh, workshop, found a costume and then, you know, uh, going through some illustrations and picked a head and he found a great werewolf head for me. Well, they put together this werewolf head for me and the, the actor who played it, he was like, uh, like seven feet tall. So, you know, and then he had the head on top, which was uh, uh, mechanically controlled, electronically controlled and everything. And it was a beautiful werewolf. So Greg, 
you know, Greg came through for me in, in, in a lot of a lot of times. And uh, and it was great working with him on Walking Dead. You know, he was just uh, the man. You've also done a, six episodes of Law and Order. Now, what what is it like working on a in a in the Dick in the Dick Wolf Factory compared to everything else that, that you've done? Well, I was working on Law and Order as a cinematographer. I was the first. I was the first director of photography. I shot the first six episodes. Okay. I mean, you know, it was uh, episodic TV. It was, uh, I think, it was eight day episodes. I mean, th- but that, yeah, that's like sure episodic, was- episodic TV. That that's like that's like paint by numbers episodic TV, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, but you know, but you knew, you kind of knew when the stories were going to come out or what stories were going to be told because they it seemed like they got all their script ideas from the New York Post. <laughs> which was like, you know, kind of like the uh, the, the New York rag for uh, all kinds of uh, uh, stuff happening in the city. So, you know, if it was in the post, chances are like two or three weeks later, it was going to be uh, a script of uh, of uh, Law and Order. But it was um, it was cool. I mean, you know, it was um, it was fun while we were on location hmm. because uh, the courtroom scene. They got kind of uh, dry because it was the, the set was pre lit. Just uh-huh. go in, turn on the lights, and sometimes put, put a little bounce card in here and stuff like that. But the locations was uh, was pretty. Being a location was pretty interesting. I had it in my contract that after six episodes, I either renegotiate to stay or leave. And I think it was around that time that Spike announced he was going to do another film. So I I, ele- I elected to leave. But we started that handheld style. Um, and, uh, we actually probably did the first iteration of the bungee cam, which really was a grip stand with the arm and then the, the, the the elastic cords and and holding up the camera Mm -hmm. because my operator, so my operator could do the handheld feel without actually supporting the weight of the camera. So, uh, so we did that a lot and, uh, it was, you know, fast and, you know, fast and dirty. What are you looking forward to doing once the strike ends? Well, we have some projects that we're lining up. Um, my wife and I wrote a, a couple of horror films. I actually had an interview today about a horror film, possible horror film. We'll see what's going on. Um, talking with different people about some things. Uh, hopefully Gil and I will be talking about some things. You know, <laughs> we'll be meeting on something pretty soon. Um, Hopefully, uh, yeah. You know, uh, I've been writing, been using it uh, to spend a lot of time doing writing. So uh, we have this film, No Face, which is kind of like a reverse uh, version of um, uh, Yu Sang's Desires, Eyes Without a Face, the Franju film, and looking at always looking at stuff, always looking for material, mm-hmm. and um, and um, and I have. Uh, an Edgar Allan Poe anthology that I want to try and do one day. But I was able to up, but Edgar Allan Poe said modern day or near future. Because I think his stories do translate very well. Near future set in a fascist America, which... Unimaginable, such such a thing. I started writing it when Trump first started running for president, because Mm. I was trying to imagine the worst. And it's actually something that, you know, we actually tried to make back in the early 90s, late, no, the late 90s, I'm sorry, before Showtime went uh, went into series. You know, we tried to do it as an anthology film. So uh, still working on it. It's called The Haunted Palace. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, you know, just uh, trying to keep working. That is the, uh, you know, what, what people don't understand about this business is it is, it's very hard to, to get onto this mountain, but that's not the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is staying on the mountain once you've gotten onto the mountain. Yeah. That, and, and doing what, and doing what you want to do. And, and doing what you want to do as opposed to that which you're pigeonholed into doing because you did it well the last time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you do that does happen. Yeah. You just gotta because you know, it's uh, it's still it's still a hard place to sell uh, new ideas. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, and if you have a new idea, you gotta try and figure out a way of doing it for like uh little money less money so yeah 
it is know. it is one more creative challenge. Uh, Ernest, thank you so much for sitting down with us and, and having this conversation. I, I you know it's it's funny you work with people and yet you, you you never get a chance to know them as well as you'd like to. And I, I thank you for doing this today. I, I feel like finally I know you. Well, no, thank you for having me. It was great to see you again, man. It's well, even, even though I know you a little bit better than maybe Alan does or did, I, I also learned some stuff today that, I, that I'm very impressed with. And I'm really glad you came on and really happy, glad we had this opportunity. Yeah, I am. We're so glad we had this time together. <laughs> yep. Well, let's do it again this time. <laughs> hey, you know what? We, we have a lot more yet to talk about. And uh, yeah, let, let's make that make that a point. Uh, thank you again, Ernest, and uh, hey, thank you everyone for, for tuning in. We'll see you next time. The How Not to Make a Movie podcast is executive produced by me, Alan Katz, by Gil Adler, and by Jason Stein. Our artwork was done by the amazing Jody Webster, and Jason and Jody, along with Mando, are all the hosts of the fun and informative Dads from the Crypt podcast. Follow them for what my old pal, the Crypt Keeper, would have called terrible Crypt Cover.